Hello, welcome to another episode of Global Pause, Rethink the Future. So today I want to talk more on sovereignty, uh, the way how that we would kind of frame uh, what it is, uh, but then look at the the issues associated with the, the I suppose, the ideal or the, the how we would understand it. And if, because maybe we can frame, the way, the way how we could frame this is that if there's always been a claim on life, um, so if somebody's always making a claim on your life, then to seek autonomy for oneself has that context. And so the reason why uh, sovereignty, if you associate or conflate it with autonomy, is essentially to be independent from a claim over your life that is otherwise substantiated or has been substantiated through history. Um, so whether or not that the substantiation of the claim is legitimate or illegitimate, we could say that maybe what's occurring now on the face of the planet is that a lot of the power that presupposes its unsurpassability and so therefore its claim over life is now being revealed as being contingent. Its contingency is ultimately um, based upon what we do and so it's yet to play itself out because people are still acting the way how they've been habitualized into acting. And so when if you if you think of it like that, then even if you presuppose a, a form of uh, sovereignty or autonomy for yourself, are you really addressing the issue at hand or are you actually substantiating the claim because to presuppose this sovereignty is to – especially when it's in reference to an ideal, right, we could say that sovereignty is an ideal, but how is that, is that uh, ideal of sovereignty also uh, given in context to another ideal? And so if we don't explore sovereignty in reference to the ideals that we're ultimately or the principles that should underwrite our lives, does it actually undermine the whole initiative or do we actually in fact uh, substantiate uh, the current paradigm um, in ways that we don't even recognise that we're actually doing. And so to, to look at the understanding of sovereignty is important because it ultimately relates to the, our actions, but then our actions obviously is determined by uh, what we're ultimately focused on as far as other ideal, ideals go. So if we look at, say, sovereignty, now we, people think of to, to be sovereign is that Sovereignty is always in reference to the political understanding of what constitutes it. So, you know, if you understand that, we always think of sovereignty as kingship. And so kingship is a, a, is a ruler that has a, a dominion over, you know, over its over a territory, as, as it were. Now, we could say that, that to be... To be sovereign is to have a sense of autonomy over that. But then it means to say that you either got vassals, so it's the relationality that is a determining factor when you are understanding your sovereignty. Because if you're understanding your sovereignty in the sense of a king, let's just say, use the king as a classic example, then that understanding presupposes a way of interacting with other sovereigns. All right, so other sovereigns. So the nature of sovereignty is a kind of impoverished way of understanding life if the model that you are looking at, the way of substantiating autonomy, ultimately has its uh, pre antecedents uh, within kingship and you only have to look at the relationality that kings v other kings has actually created on the face of the planet. You know, So whether or not you're looking at, uh, say, from the aspect of war – or then what the, what's the kind of relation that, that kings, say, in, uh, engaged in? So they had emissaries that, that were meant to engage uh, the other lord or the king and so therefore approach them from the station as such and whereby maybe through, say, alliances. So the, the, way, the relationality is an alliance. So think of what an alliance means in that context. Alliance is about preserving the, the, the presupposition of your domain or your, your realm, as it were, and so therefore the alliance is a, a way of maintaining your realm in reference to another person that, or king that's maintaining their realm. And so through the, the kind of the nature of um, diplomacy, you're, you're trying to re remove the threat of violence that would obviously not be in the best interest for both kings because ultimately all their populace would suffer. So if you think of it like that, the relate, and you, so if you think that, okay, that relates to a king, we're going to say, well, that's completely different to people, but actually is it? All right, so if you think that we've individualised time to such a degree that we, we presuppose that we're sovereign, what are we sovereign over? 
all right? So we could say over ourselves, over our actions, our choices, but how much basically autonomy do we have for our choices when, um, you know, our way of life is a given, all right? So our way of life has been handed down. So if our life has been handed down, then it's handed down with all these presuppositions that are yet to be questioned. And so one of the one of the, the presuppositions is the nature of autonomy or a sovereignty. But if you have recourse to that in order to justify uh, your understanding of your agency, but then you don't have the, you don't understand the what's set and trained for the relationality, and so a form of diplomacy or protecting your realm, then we have to look at well, what is the realm? All right, that necessitates a form of diplomacy. What is it that you secure as your your dominion or your realm? So, if you think of it, the individualization of time and the way how that immunitizes uh, a lot of land, your sovereignty only extends as far as that goes, does it? Doesn't extend any far further beyond it. Okay, because what is common, if you're going to look at, well, what is common in that regard? It's the same orientation towards life that you would share with other people that presuppose their sovereignty, does it not? And so if you look at that, then you say, well, what else do you share in common? You share in common the, the, the actions that substantiates basically that limited realm that you are orientated towards for you to stand in there and say that you are sovereign. All right, so once again, the issue here is that if you are like so, the case in point, say of a king, the king is he doesn't want to become a vassal of another king. So therefore, through diplomacy, it maintains the realm, and so therefore they are independent. This is where empires, you know, the expansion of empires and the way how. So whether or not you're looking at say Alexander, or you're looking at the Persian Empire, or you're looking at the Roman Empire, where where essentially these kings became vassals of the emperor, and so they lost their their independence. So the key, the key, the case the the key point here is that sovereignty is always held in reference to the independent that's presupposed when you're securing your realm, especially when it runs up against other sovereigns that presupposes their unsurpassability only extends as far as their demand goes. Okay, so the case in point here is that they they bound together. But then if you draw it back and you relate it to an individual's life or the marginal form of life that we inhabit being a consumer, that means to say that ultimately your sovereignty is orientated towards your independence. So independence in this case means what? You cannot be leveraged. You have a sense of autonomy, all right, of agency that is not corrupted or is not marginal or it cannot be compromised. So once again, then we're forced to ask, is the way, uh, the, the, the way of understanding sovereignty and our understanding of independence, does that facilitate that? Does it achieve the ideal? Does it achieve the, the independence that presuppose? Or does it rather compromise it in ways that you just simply will not be uh, uh, cognizant of because you've been sold on a story of it that has its antecedents within the history of, say, kingship, and then you understand the relationality that's set in train uh, when you are presupposing your independence or your realm that you are protecting? So the case in point here is, is that, that if you don't give due regard to that, then ultimately what you set up is a way of substantiating the marginality of the form of life that's presupposed. And so this, this issue is a, is a spiritual issue. And so if you look at the spiritual community in inverted commas and you understand that people talk about sovereignty at length, Right. What are the, how do they define sovereignty? And if they're talking about the nature of autonomy or the nature of um, being, say, a protector, as it were, then all these things are inherently, inherently got to do with the nature of the way how it's been defined in history. All right, so because sovereignty is always is a political concept, or you can say it's a religious concept. So once again, if we're going to understand uh, what we are trying to potentialize for life, we have to look at that sovereignty in reference to the exceptionalism. All right, that it's presupposed within the concept. Now, the presupposition of the exceptionalism is completely different to the, the securing of a realm and the independence from a claim, whether or not it's imperial claim or whether or not it's another uh, king that's expanding, wants to expand their realm at the, at the expense of, you know, yours, as it were. Completely different. So in that context, what you're looking at... So what you have, you have the scenario of the exceptionalism. All right, so the exceptionalism here is over life. 
All right. So if you think of the exceptionalism of, of a, a king presupposes a form of life of the populace, so whether or not it was vassals or plebs, so therefore peasantry, then there was a form of life that was presupposed with that sovereignty, was there not? And so depending upon uh, the, the, the historical context will determine maybe the, the form of life of the people, as it were. So if we look at it from the aspect of the individualization of sovereignty is, as far as what it's been bequeathed to a consumer that is sovereign, well, the limitation, if you're going to look at your realm, is, is the kingdom of your wants, okay, the kingdom of your wants, your demand, all right, so, but that's the exceptionalism is only demonstrated through your preferences. It does, it's not potentializing the exceptionalism to the form. Now, the exceptionalism to the form is a completely different. So if you're looking at the, the, the way how you're potentializing the form and you're looking at, well, to potentialize the form is, an inherent, is inherently creative, then you are literally looking at the, the, create, the creativity that's set in train that is the, the potential for a world. Now, a world is, is something where kings, uh, kings or realms are given, with, with, given within, we can say. So let's explore that. So if you say, let's say that you have a scenario, and this is why this is why our way of life is spiritual, and you can understand it, and you can understand this from a Christian point of view as well. When you're looking at, say, the way how Christianity spread through um, the, the the Roman Empire, because if you had a spiritual kind of movement within that realm, within within the, the empire, and so there were different kind of vassal states to a certain degree uh, within the, within the empire as such. Um, or tributaries or, or vassals or however way you just want to describe it, and yet you had a spiritual kind of um, uh, story or a story that was spreading and that, that was facilitated uh, through the imperial kind of domain of Rome, um, what you have is that you have a way of, of any kind of principality, as it were, or any kind of domain that may have been within, within the, the empire it's potentializing basically something within those the the milieu, the, the cultural milieu, uh, because there's obviously all different kind of cultural milieu, say within that the imperium that basically reigns. But then it, ultimately, what it's doing is potentializing uh, maybe an understanding of life, and so therefore a particular form of life. Now, Christianity was not obviously successful in any way, shape, or form because it didn't address any other. If it's an eschatological, uh, say, movement within Judaism, and you know a lot of the the you know, sayings attributed to Christ kind of paints him as an apocalyptic kind of figure and the, the world is nigh kind of scenario when that, you know, you have to kind of sell up all your all your worldly goods in order for the, the kingdom of God that's uh, near at hand, then at that uh, apocalypse doesn't lend itself towards the temporal realm or to, to earth. And maybe that's one of the, the other worldliness of of that um, of the movement is doesn't lend itself towards crystallizing essentially the spirit of God um, through history. It's kind of it's it's what it's done. It's it's actually kind of suffered a, an inversion because the other world worldly is eventually become immunitized to such a degree where it's marginalized um, life whereby we are specters or ghosts and that's literally just through the way that we uh, economize something that doesn't exist so the scenario here is that if, but if you but you can use Christianity in the way how it moved through say the the Imperium of Rome to understand that these the, these domains so let's look at it from the aspect of say of the, the where we are now so we have the same scenario. We have all these different countries. You have you have all so they just presuppose a form of life, which is a consumer, all right. So the extent of agency is limited to your to your demand. You don't create the world, and you and people are sold on that way of life. So if you had the scenario that you have a a way that that's ennobling or is engaging people with a story about that they're more than their wants, but they can actually create the world, and they set about doing that, then ultimately what you're, what's occurring there is that you're changing the form of life. But you're changing the form of life within basically a realm of, of, of the sovereignty that's presupposed there. Now, that sovereignty is always held in check or against the, the form of life that's presupposed. So whether or not you're a pleb or whether or not you're a serf, that's the presupposition of that form of life that was given within that milieu for that sovereign or prince or whatever to presuppose that it had vassals. 
All right, so the case here, so a consumer is, is an, like I said, is an imperial form of life that's spread right around the globe that is, that is the denominator for life, but then that form of life is given within specific different realms, okay? So therefore, if you potentialize that form of life, the form of life is shifting, and so therefore in reference to basically sovereignty that is presupposed within that realm. So the case in point here is that, but if, how does that work? If, if the person is no is making an exception to the form of life, then they're potentializing their life beyond their management, beyond the management that's presupposed in that in that realm or that the nation, as it were. Let's put it in just a nation. It's no longer a realm. Let's just call it a nation. All right. So that means to say that there is there is a potential anomaly that's occurring that is actually undermining the power of the state, all right, or of the or of the nation, as it were. If you're going to look at, it, if you're going to conflate the nation with the institutions uh, that are basically that that it, it, it is bequeathed, you know, history is bequeathed. It. So the context here is that your understanding of sovereignty, if you're relating it to the exception to the form of life, then it relates to your actions and the way how you produce yourself as such. Because a person can say that they're sovereign, and they can they can they can say that they're autonomous. But if their actions are marginal in reference to life, then the form of life that they inhabit is always marginal. All right? They might have the pretense to be indivisible because they presuppose that they have, they're autonomous. But their, their autonomy is based upon a contingency of, say, securing wealth for themselves. And so therefore they can say that they have that certain element of autonomy. But the relationality is a key determiner here that indicates that what the way how a person sells themselves on their unsurpassability or their autonomy is always contingent in reference to the relationality. So if the relationality is commercially orientated, then what you said in train is the same kind of relationality that a king would have had in a certain kind of way. You know, it, it, differing in degrees because of the nature of, of, um, of, uh, uh, you know, of what's set in train when you're looking at the relation that a king would have with other kings as such. But if you could think that the way how they facilitated maybe uh, better relations was through trade, that was one of the key points. So it means to say that the relationality between one, say, principality or one, you know, kingdom v another was done through commerce. So if you look at it from that aspect, your relationality with other people, if you're looking at it from an individualised pers perspective, is commerce. So that there's, the, there's no spiritual kind of dynamism that is in, engendered as a result of that, that autonomy or that sovereignty. But Because the exceptionalism is, is not potentialising the form of life. The exceptionalism is the exception to a claim over life and that you presuppose if you have enough resources that you can be independent from the claim that somehow that means to say that you constitute yourself is autonomous. But that just presupposes a form of relationality that you're beholden to anyway. All right, so the, the issue here is, is that the nature of the way how you understand sovereignty is problematic because the ideal of independence is this thing that you're ultimately focused on. So if you look at, but th this is why when you're looking at the form of life, you're looking at literally your actions, and your actions implicate the relationality, and if they implicate the relationality, then that's the way how you are becoming indivisible as a person that is that is ultimately uh, autonomous but the autonomy that you that you are not that you become it's not that you are you are seeking something in order to secure what is the great security well it's literally the, the spirit it's the story or the spirituality that is being realized and the only way that a spirituality is being realized is through a, a bloody an insight into life in such a way that you can understand what you're releasing and what are you releasing you're literally releasing the creativity that you otherwise don't animate when you presuppose a form of sovereignty or independence from a claim that has its antecedents within history. All right, but you but you substantiate it all the more at, for, for your actions. So the case in uh, point, so if we look at it once again, we're potentialising the form of life of the consumer and you think that that happens everywhere on the face of the planet. Right, so what it's doing, it's potentialising life in individually in different areas. So whereas there were, there were states, right, you are potentialising a people, but a people that are separated in different places. 
uh, but that share the same thing. So you can understand that what, what occurs in that scenario is something that is very unique that's never happened before because when the, when the, when the, 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 the shifting of the form of life is, is starts to potentialise itself whereby, well, what happens then? Let's say that you've got a place over in the States and there's one over in America and you realise that you are, you are the same because it's the, it comes from the same story, it's the same root, it's the same thing. What's the relationality that you set and train for yourself? Are you relating to each other through commerce? No. What, how could what, why, how, how would that work? Why, why would you be relating through commerce when you're potentializing the relationality in your community? And so therefore, it, um, or let's look at it, let's not it's probably more difficult. Look at it from the like the state. So we'll pick an area in America where there's one kind of community that's doing the same thing and another one. And they're separated, let's say by 100, 100, um, 100 miles or whatever the case may be. So you have the scenario here of that they're close enough together where are they going to relate through through trade or through commerce or they're going to relate through their indivisibility and the way how that they the way the art of their way of life the way how they express their life whereby they come together for for life it's nothing else than life it's indivisible so it's the way it, they're being separate this provides the potential for them to come together in a way that they can create that's it Simple as that. Create what? Well, what do they share? What's common? So let's think of that. So if you have a people that, that is 30 people over here and there's 30 people over there and there's 30 people over there and they all share the same thing but they realise there's things that they could do that they need that they could create even more. So maybe that relates to education. So you have more people that are ultimately orientated towards life in a different way means to say that the education shifts, does it not? Of course it does. So if the education is shift and that's what they share in common because their the way of life is what they share in common, then the commonality is something that engenders uh, something else that is the embodiment of that ethos. So you're creating a way of acculturation uh, for their children or for people um, generally in the community as such. And so therefore that's, this becomes an initiative, a common initiative that they share but then it relates to the art of the way how these things are, are done. If you're shifting the form of life and so therefore you are less than commercial relationality and it's becoming artful, then it's the indivisibility that is expressed through that, that education is the principal thing that you're focused on. So, you know, so if you're looking at it from they, – because they, you could say that they're otherwise they're separate and then you, let's look at it from the aspect that they thought that they, they, they were sovereign. All right, so what are they? They're sovereign and, but they're having independence. They're independent from each other, are they not? If you're looking at it from the aspect of, say, sovereignty, you know, from you as an individual, but let's say that they're a collective and they're, in, and they're individual and so therefore they are, they're independent from each other and so therefore they presuppose their, their sovereignty or their autonomy – it's a completely different way because if they're indivisible and they realise what they share is their indivisibility and they're coming from the same root, if, if I could use that term, it's completely different because then it relates to, I always talk about, the permeability or the, the threshold of where your indivisibility starts and ends. Right, because if that that means to say that what they share, they share something, and it's a way how that the boundary becomes is where um, something new is created. Right, because ultimately they share the commonality. So they're not; it's not they're pitting against each other because one presupposes they're independent, and so does the other one because they're both sovereign. And they have a realm. You know, there's no realm. There's no realm because it's literally looking at the way how that you're indivisible and so therefore you're removing marginality or boundaries out of what you do. So the, the principal thing here is that indivisibility is the key, key consideration that actually un, if you understand that, you understand that, well, independence means to say it's interdependence and ultimately the the ind, the independence that you seek for yourself as an individual if you've individualized time is really a common surpassing that you create with other people and so once again you're opening yourself up to the potential to 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 animate this thing throughout throughout the world and yet through that what you have you have the scenario say let's say you have that in in the states but then you have the same thing occurring somewhere else on the other planet you have in australia you have in france you have in all these places they all share the same thing now, what happens when you have enough people doing exactly the same thing? They're all they're autonomous. They, you could say they're autonomous, but they share that indivisibility as to what they're doing, and that's the commonality. There is no management. All right, it's inherently democratic, as I said. If you start to look at democracy from creativity, and that, that means to say that you're working from the ground up, 
Uh, you work from the ground up. It's a completely different way of understanding uh, ultimately what we presuppose for life. And so if you do that, you are unmarketing life. You are removing the legitimacy of the unsurpassability of the state that presupposes it can manage people for ends outside themselves. And so through doing that, you lessen the binding on people because that imperial form of life is what, uh, is what disciplines people. All right? you, have a, you have a space or you have a, a place where you share where that's not given and that's freeing then ultimately what you're doing is that you're freeing the fetters of civilization, planetary civilization, collectively all at the same time, separated in space, different areas on the uh, face of the planet. But through that, what you're doing is that you are you are removing something and then you share in the creation of, the share in the indivisibility, and then you give it enough time. You, the, the culture that will be bequeathed to the planet is like nothing that we have ever seen before, ever. It is a completely unique. And the only way that comes about simply is literally, it's this crazy, is literally through the way how you act, how we act. We either, we either presuppose that we can economise time as a thing that is no thing and so therefore secure our time as a supplement. If we don't potentialise the relationality for a common surpassing and through a higher order of cooperation, we will never hold that out for our ancestors as the bequeathal, our legacy. We'll never hold it. Because this thing, if it was to work, it's going to take obviously a while for it to feed through uh, the culture at large to get to the point where the whole earth is given as one. But alt is indivisible. This is ultimately, and that that's. But you can understand if that's the goal. Indivisibility is the goal. Think about how long it would take for the the whole Earth to be indivisible. If you start out in different areas on the face of the planet with the same common denominator, and yet you know it's mar very marginal to begin with. It's only the vanguard, basically, of people that do that. It's completely, you know, it takes it takes generations for this thing to feed uh, feed through the culture at large. But then it'll get to an inflection point where it'll just be that that the ways of life, the ways of doing, the ways of being are so stark. All right, but maybe we could even say that the, what's occurring now is there's such a break in the world that the change that will come about will come about actually that much more quicker um, because it's a paradigm shift because it's going to wake people up, but they're still asleep to what actually what they presuppose, you know. And we, we're we're not even yet, we're not even in any position to see the potential of any kind of change yet. We're not even getting close to anything because I always say that nobody is changing the way how that they act. We all, we all practice business activity. So if we think that anything's going to change for the, for the future, if we presuppose business activity and business activity is just the way how they were orientated towards life, nothing's changed at the moment as far as that goes. So that has to be, that has to be demonstrated. That has to be actualised. Once you know, business activity is no longer the current ruling paradigm for human ac action, then you'll understand that there's a difference that's occurring in the world and that difference will, will mark itself as separate. And then you'll have something that will compete on its merits. And so we're not even we're not even even and that relates to the the exceptionalism of your choice, which has nothing to do with uh, well, it's it's a better way of understanding sovereignty and not like looking at it from the aspect of a, of a, a claim or or uh, independence you're really looking at indivisibility anyway until next time take care